The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Who New Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Ask for Candy, where we talk about healing, self-care, love, sex, relationships, and what it takes to be amazing on the daily. Who I am, I am Candice Harper, lovecoach.com, and my purpose with this podcast is to create healthy romantic relationships all around the world through self-love, soul connections, and sweetness. But before we get to that, we are now partnered with Solivity Magazine. I think we are in week three and going strong and living happily and loving every minute of it. And so you can check us out on Solivity TV on SolivityMagazine.com. And from now on, we will be live every Wednesday, 7 o'clock Eastern. And you can also check us out on YouTube, we're live. And on Twitter, we're live. And here on the Facebook, we are live. Don't forget to also subscribe to our audio broadcast, Ask for Candy on Anchor, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and wherever you normally download your podcasts. So you can also email us, askforcandypodcast at gmail.com if you have any questions, anything you want to say, but you're too shy to comment on social media. Not very many of us out there are too shy to comment on social media. Some people should be more shy to comment on social media, but they're not, and that's okay. But if you are, email us, askforcandypodcast at gmail.com. Now, for those of you who've been listening and been with me for the last couple of years or so, you know that for almost nine years, I've been a relationship coach, a workshop facilitator, and now a professional matchmaker with Talkify Dating Service. And if you've never heard of it, it's an amazing digital service where you can hire a matchmaker to do all the sifting and the vetting on your behalf. That's what I do. I sift and I vet. And it's especially for people who struggle with initiating contact or simply, simply picking the right partner. I mean, you know, even matchmakers need a matchmaker. No one really picks for themselves all that well. Sometimes they do, don't get me wrong. But for the most part, it's it can be a struggle. That's why there's so many single people out there, and that's why there's so much divorce. Matchmaking and relationship coaching are my zone of genius. And the best part about it is that week to week, I get to grow and learn as I interact with people around the most intimate part of their lives. I get to meet and nurture new clients. I get to screen possible dating candidates for them. I get to design programs and activities that deepen their ability to get to know each other. And most importantly, I get to be part of what supports healthy beginnings and sustainably healthy relationships. I get to be the cause of self-love, soul connections, and sweetness. And tonight... I want you to, I really want you to stick around for the whole show because I started a new segment last week called Matchmaker Moments where I ask you the questions that clients ask me so you can do a little matchmaking at home and practice maybe being your own matchmaker or being a matchmaker for your friends. But, you know, we'll have a conversation about, you know, the problems that come up around dating when you are working with a matchmaker and, you know, what are some good things that a matchmaker can tell you to help you date better and date more effectively. I will also get to present a featured client profile in case of you, in case you know of a possible match for my client, because you never know, you might be that possible match for my client. And with me tonight, as always, from now on, is my Brian from Solivity Magazine, editor of Solivity Magazine. You want to say hi to the people, Brian? What's going on, Candy? What's I'm up? I'm so glad. We got, this is going to be a hot show. I feel like it is. I feel like it's going to be a good one, right? There's like a crackle in the air. Tonight, we are going to talk about why Will and Jada work. For those of you who watch Red Table Talk, and if you don't watch Red Table Talk, you know, do yourself a favor, jump on in, because it is pretty compelling to watch. I'm not someone who chases celebrity, celebrity gossip, or celebrity activity, but I really do think that there's a lot of value in this show, and I like the way that Jada uses her celebrity, and the whole family, basically, because she gets her mother involved normally and her daughter involved, uses their celebrity to talk about vulnerable conversations and, you know, being real, as real as, you know, 
as real as I feel like people can be when they're in the public eye, because, you know, you're really putting yourself out there when you tell all your personal business, but also in a way that is very um, self-aware and taking responsibility for their own stuff and admitting to making mistakes, which I think we live in a society right now where no one wants to admit that they make mistakes. And so I think that they have found a very healthy way to use their celebrity in order to open up conversations that we all could be having, that we all need to be having, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now, right? And so I want to talk about their most recent show, which was Will and Jada sitting down talking about an extramarital relationship that Jada had. And, you know, for those of you who do follow celebrity gossip, there was a lot of stuff around whether they were in an open relationship and whether Will was gay and, you know, all this stuff. Their their relationship has been a hot topic for many gossip shows and all of that. I don't care about any of that. That's not what we're going to get into. But what I love is that they, I think they cleared up a lot of that. And I get that, you know, we have a certain perspective on, on, you know, what they were talking about that is limited because we're not in their relationship. But I do really feel as though, intuitively, I feel as though we got a lot of truth from the conversation that they had on the show. So I wanted to talk about that conversation because I think it was controversial for a lot of people, definitely controversial for a lot of married people or people who are in long-term partnerships. Because I think we have a framework of how you're supposed to be when someone um, is is you know commits adultery or someone cheats on you, someone uh, you know has an emotional cutting off for whatever reason when there's conflict. I think that we have this sort of conditioning for how that's supposed to go that had a lot of people respond to this in a way that made it seem like you know, the way that they were sort of dealing with it and handling it was weird and off-putting. And, you know, I even had a couple friends who commented who were like, they couldn't like get with the conversation they were having. Brian, how about you? You're my married man voice in the machine. You and your wife, did you guys both watch the whole session? Did you watch the whole show? We watched it individually. You did. Um, But I'm kind of scared about going into this one. You know, Well, what did what did you like when you were watching it? What did you feel about it as a married man watching these two people talk about their sort of trials and tribulations and how they've handled them over the over the years or whatever? What came up for you? Well, I was thinking about um, specifically the journey that they had taken together and that they described very, very honestly during the Red Table Talk. I mean, I can imagine that this was different for both of them yeah. to be up, to come out publicly and talk about the struggles that they had as a couple. And that I think it was really helpful because it broke, it breaks kind of the myths of, oh, well, you know, you meet, you date, yeah. um, a proposal is made. You get married, and then it's ha- happily Happy ever, ever after. after. Yeah, you know, yeah. and that that there's nothing else that you need to do, and that's just completely unfounded right. and not true at all. That in fact, it bring you know that kind of closeness brings even more stuff out. Yeah, that you're going to have to deal with at an intimate level. So, I think I thought it was beautiful. I thought that at the end of the day, of for you know, I think a lot of it was sensationalized. I mean, you know the whole entanglement thing got kind of like blown blown up yeah but when you watch the whole video and you go through the whole thing and you go all the way to the end this was a couple who found themselves together totally and um uh and really it really defines what intimacy is about what true intimacy is about Absolutely. 100%. And I love what you said about the happily ever after, too, because I think just the fact that even though we cognitively know that happily ever after is a myth, I think we still go into relationships believing and expecting to have happily ever after. And that's why when conflict arises, we have such a hard time with it, as if we're never supposed to have a problem with this person we've tied our lives to. Right. (laughs) You know? So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Brian. And I think that probably a lot of people... um, 
experienced what you you experienced in watching it. And I think that a lot of people went in another direction and were just like, they're crazy. It's because they're eccentric rich people. And you know, <laughs> they're just, you know, nobody reacts like that and whatever. But I know you were kind enough to find and, and cut us down a nice little clip to show the people. For those of you who haven't seen the show, Brian got us a clip, honey. So let's pull it out. We we'll pull it out and let the people see. Yeah. separate for a period of time and you go figure out how to make yourself happy and I'll figure out how to make myself happy. Well, at that particular point in time, it was indefinite. Yeah, I really felt like we could be over. Yeah, know? no, and, we were over. And then what did you do, Jada? Well, you know, I think from there, you know, as time went on, I got into a different kind of entanglement with August. And one thing I want to get clear about with clean up, one of the things that was kind of swirling in the press about you giving permission, which is, uh, you know, the only person that can give permission in, in, in that particular uh, yeah. uh, circumstance is myself. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But what August was probably trying to communicate, mm-hmm. because I could actually see how he would perceive it as permission because we were separated amicably and I think he also wanted to make it clear that he's not a homewrecker which he's not I was in a lot of pain and I was very broken now in the process of that relationship I definitely realized that you can't find happiness Wow. <laughs> Whenever I watch the watch the show the first time and then even just in watching that clip, like like I just everything that I feel like I preach about all the time, I feel like they are are really good solid examples of what I'm talking about. Because one thing I always want to be really clear about is that no matter what kind of relationship you're in as far as a romantic relationship, a friendship, a familial relationship, the acceptance that the, your partner or that the other person has made a mistake or can make mistakes and that you can make mistakes and that things will happen that don't necessarily go the way you expect or that you want them to because that's just the nature of human interaction. I mean, that is just sort of the cr- the crux of all of it, right? Like I was talking about earlier, it's like we have this expectation that we're never supposed to be challenged by the person that we're with. We're never supposed to, um, you know, experience any sort of uncertainty. We're never supposed to experience that we don't like something that that other person does. And when we have that framework, when we feel like the, the other person, I need to make them wrong for the things that they do that don't work for me, then that's when we have breakdowns and that's when we can't come to a meeting of the minds. And what I love about what they did whether it's completely authentic or not, we have no way of knowing that, but from what it seems like from the show, what I love about what they did is they presented... Um you know, what unconditional love really is, like how you actually can accept the other person for who they are and just be in a space of of making it work regardless of the fact that you've made mistakes or that things have gone wrong or that there's been conflict. But what I want to do, I don't know if you guys can hear the German Shepherd is outside this time around and he's barking very loud. I don't know if you can hear him or not, but I can. But what I want to do, side note, but what I want to do is break it down into what are some of the I have 10 aspects of why I think that this relationship works the way that it does. And I saw one of our um, viewers, uh, uh Javier, Javier, he wrote the word entanglement and then he put ha 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 ha. Which I thought that was interesting. Javier, if you're still watching, I want you to comment about that. Because what I'm thinking is that that when she said entanglement, there was a little level of her trying to avoid, like, fully saying what it was, right? Like, I cheated. Like, I was in another relationship. Um, You know, there was a little level of... Uh, uh, her kind of like holding back from being 100% responsible for what it is that that she did or what, what it is that transpired in that time in their relationship. But I'm going to talk about that too. I'm going to go through all of the 10 possible um, ways to 
make it work the way that Will and Jada seem to be making it work and why you don't have to be rich or famous in order for that to happen. So I want to talk about that right now. So the first one that I think is part of the reason why Will and Jada have made it work is that in this conversation, they've given up on rightness and righteousness. So the question is always, do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? So it's that framing framing of your relationship as a competition. So a lot of times what happens in relationships and what they could have so easily done here is actually, um, you know, stand on their rightness. And what Will could have done is said, you know what, you're wrong what you did to me. And I feel victimized by it. I feel like you're, you're not a good person. You're not a good wife. And let it be that black and white and that plain, that, that you know, just flat. And he could have just stood on being right. Like, I'm innocent. I'm right. Now, obviously, they did say something in the in the full clip at the end. They mentioned something that alluded to the fact that Will hasn't been innocent. But, you know, so maybe he didn't stand on it because of that. But also, if you notice in their conversation, there's no need to be making the other person wrong and to be. Uh, coming from a place of, you know, you owe me an apology, what you did to me, what you did to me. I feel like that that's a, uh, something that comes up a lot in relationships, that sort of accusatory, the things you need to make up for so that when someone does make a major mistake or step out in the relationship in a big way, it's like there's even a, more of a platform for righteousness. Now, that's not to say that you have to put up with someone being... Uh, Uh, someone else's infidelity, that's not to say that you should just blow your boundaries away and just have it be a free-for-all if that doesn't feel good for you and that's not what you want. But the willingness to uh, get into that person's space without making them wrong, without needing to get your pound of flesh, without needing to be self-righteous or stand on a higher pedestal is what makes it so that you can get a deeper understanding of that person, why they did what they did, makes it so you don't have to internalize it and be victimized by it. You get to understand that, you know, the mistakes that we make, first of all, they're about us. They're not about the the person that we're with. And you get to understand where that person is coming from if you're willing to just have a conversation with them that is not a wrong-making conversation. So that's one thing to just consider in any relationship is giving up the righteousness and the rightness. And righteousness and rightness is something that comes in a lot of different ways. It's it's when you're in a fight with someone, in conflict with someone, and you keep justifying in your mind over and over again why you're not speaking to them. It's um, when you've made somebody so wrong, somebody that you love and care about, that you're not even dealing with them anymore, even though you love and care about them. It's when you take all your anger out on somebody because you disagree with the way that they've done something. It's like it's a very pious and um, self-serving kind of way to be because it victimizes yourself and that that person needs to have done something or needs to do something to somehow make it right for you and to make up for it for you. And it's just not possible. Like it, the decision has to come from you to forgive and the decision has to come from you to to allow a person to be a human being, whether or not you decide to be with that person or stay with that person or even continue the relationship. So that's number one. Number two is that they're both really self-healing. So even when you're, especially when you're in a romantic relationship, but any kind of relationship, it is so important to be self-healing. No matter what that other person does, no matter where that other person is coming from, whether it's baggage that you've brought into the relationship or something that you feel like is only happening today, which is rarely the case, but conflict that you're having with them in the moment, The willingness to heal yourself, first of all, it's what helps you get out of rightness and righteousness, that that, you know, place that is very sabotaging to your relationship. But the healing of yourself, that growth is what makes it so that you can move through it, process it and not turn it into something more than it needs to be. And by more than it needs to be, I mean something that will sabotage your future relationships or something that causes you to put a wedge between you and that person that is impossible to remove. So a lot of times when we have conflicts, we look at Will and Jada and, you know, obviously they're very wealthy, but they have kids together and it doesn't matter how much money you have. You still got to work out, 
you know, if your relationship breaks down, how are you going to deal with your relationships with your children, right? How is that going to work? So from a space of I'm not going to grow myself and I'm going to continue to make you wrong, there's not a whole lot of room for the possibility of growth. And even if you're just boyfriend and girlfriend, right, from that space of, you know, it, this it, this is all about you and you needing to be better and I'm not willing to heal anything about myself I'm not going to, you know, if I have a problem with you, it's all about how you have to change. You have to make it better. There's no possibility in that. There's no possibility for growth for yourself. There's no possibility for growth in the relationship. So when you have a problem with a partner, you got to go inward. What I loved about their conversation is that there was a lot of pulling inward, a lot of um, inward understanding. So that questions to ask yourself with that, with the self-healing, what am I not giving myself when I have things come up with my partner? And I think uh, Jada talked about that in their conversation at the time, you know, they were going through a lot of pain. And Brian and I were talking about that earlier. She mentioned the pain thing. So what was it that she wasn't giving herself that had her step out on the relationship? Well, actually, they were on a break, but still, that she had to go and get into another relationship with someone else. She had to work on that stuff. She had to deal with that stuff. She had to grow herself up around that stuff before she could come to a place where she could communicate it with Will and there be some level of understanding around it, right? Who am I being in this relationship? You always want to ask yourself, who are you being in the relationship? Because who you're being in the relationship speaks volumes about what you're experiencing in the relationship. There's no innocent victims. I mean, you know, I say that broadly. Obviously, you have situations where people are getting hurt, but there's still it still requires a level of volunteerism. It still requires a level of sticking around for it. You know, and I'm not judging anybody for doing it because everybody's got their reasons. But you want to be willing to be able to ask yourself that question so that you can explore who you're being and who you might need to be, whether it's somebody who's stronger or somebody who's not as strong or somebody who's more honest, more vulnerable, whatever it is, you want to be willing to ask yourself. Another thing, what am I trying to force here? What am I trying to force and control? If you notice in their conversation, there was no trying to force the other one or control the other one into thinking the way they wanted them to think. There was just, here's where I'm at. And you can take it or you can leave it. Here's where I was at. And you can take it or you can leave it. And what am I making wrong? Because if I'm judging something and I'm making it wrong and I'm harping on it, you better believe there's something going on with me where I'm not filling myself up and I need that self-righteousness in order to fill myself up. This time like goes by so fast. We're almost halfway through the show. So I want to do a few more of these before we cut for commercial. Brian, how are you feeling about things? Has anything come up for you in the course of all of this? Woo! I know. I'm like fire hose in the people. Well, I mean, it's so multifaceted, right? Yeah. Where um, I think people forget that if you were doing work before you got into a relationship, you're still going to be doing work after you get into a relationship. Yes. And that it's going to be in the context of you working with someone. It's, it's, it's the independent plus the interdependence, yeah. right? Yeah. Not dependent, interdependent. Yeah. Uh, uh, this that you have to work on. And it's just, and again, it's, 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 it's not easy sometimes. It's, it is work. Yeah. There is work in it. And that's what kind of came up for me. I mean, that that um, that there was some deep pain that both of them had. Yeah. And they had to support each other through it. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And if they didn't with them, if they didn't do it with the with with in that relationship, they were going to still create another relationship where they will still have to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why the self-healing is so important. And, and I, I think... You know, when we are willing to do the self-healing and something that you said about that they had to support each other through it. So oftentimes we think that we need to beg support from another person or expect support from another person. But if you're willing to heal yourself and work on yourself, naturally the people who care about you want to support you with it. And I think in a partnership, when you have two people who have the willingness to heal and the willingness to look at themselves and say, what can I bring? Then that support is something that happens organically. You never have to beg for someone's support because if you're in the place of begging for it, asking for it, being needy about it, then you're not filling yourself up and you're having an expectation that that person give you something that you're not giving yourself. 
And so I think that can sometimes have it come to loggerheads. And that's what I love about their conversation is that with both of them, they're they're now, probably not in the past based on what they were saying, but they are now in a place where they get that they had to grow themselves up in order to, to come to a place where they can even support each other through this, right? And be so and be so adult about something that is usually such a hot button issue in a, in a relationship. So that goes to number three, that they own their own shit. Like owning your shit, be willing to fess up and be humble. Now, I know Jada kind of pulled back on it a little bit by calling it an entanglement. (laughs) But for the most part, she was owning that she was in a lot of pain and she made a choice and, you know, how she felt about that choice and how that choice affected the relationship that they were in as far as her perspective is concerned. And she allowed Will to talk about how that choice affected him in the relationship without taking it personally and wanting to fight him on it, fight him on his feelings, argue with what he says he feels. You know, a lot of times we go back to that rightness and righteousness where if someone calls us out on stuff or if someone talks about how they're feeling, we can't hear it. We don't want to hear it because we feel like it's just about us and it's about, you know, something that we did wrong. But when someone is sharing their own shit, like this is what I did, this was my perspective, this is how I felt about it, that's ownership, So you want to be able to do that, and you also want to allow other people to do that in any relationship, in any partnership. Another thing, number four, emotional maturity. And I'm no, I know I'm fire hosing you guys, and you know that's how I do. So I want you to, um, when you're watching this video, you can rewind and you can go back because we still got a whole lot more of these. Emotional maturity. They're not doing that make up for what my parents didn't give me thing. And so we know if you've watched the Red Table Talk, you know, Jada, she has her mom on a lot. And the couple times that Will has ever been on, they're very candid about, you know, their past with their parents, her mom having been through, you know, abusive relationships and drug use and all of that stuff and what they dealt with with their parents. So we all could go back and blame our parents for what we didn't get. And a lot of times we get into relationships hoping that the romantic relationship is going to fill the hole and is going to be the thing. And, you know, we recreate what our familiar, familial and parent relationships were in our romantic relationships in the hopes that the romantic relationship is going to be the healer, which it is not. It is unfair to expect your romantic relationship to heal your past. But the emotional maturity is when you can stop making your partner be the uh, the band-aid or to, to be the, the antidote for whatever you're dealing with from the past. You know, if you had, like I have a father who I absolutely love and adore as an adult woman. When I was a kid, there was a lot of emotional abandonment. I know as an adult that my father didn't know how to have an emotionally intimate, and we're going back, you know, I'm Generation X, so we're going back some decades. <laughs> the ability, the emotional ability to be able to connect with a daughter in in a communicative emotional way because he comes from a generation that generally men didn't know how to do that so I can understand that I can forgive him for that and there were definitely times in my adult life that I've gotten in relationships with people men in particular where there was an expectation that they fulfill what was missing which was that love of daddy and I want you to you know love me in a way that you know you treat me like a princess whatever all that crap that we we load on to when we don't heal that stuff and that's emotional maturity which is what I think they really brought to the red table in this discussion number five shared vision so when you have a long game with somebody a shared vision for what you want to create as a couple. You know you're building towards something, and the more specific you can get, the better. And it's I think it's unique for every couple. I feel like that is sort of the, the foundation and the structure with which you can continue to work through when all the minutia starts to happen. So by minutia, and it may not feel like minutia to you, but the infidel- infidelity, you know, the mistakes, the the things that happen that are conflicting with what love feels like, the expectations, the fights, all of that stuff. 
when there is a long game, a big game, a big vision to be created, that stuff can be indication of, you know, some things that need to be smoothed over or communication that needs to be had rather than deal breakers and, you know, things that escalate into bigger things and end the relationship. Because you're focused on something, you're focused on what you're creating and whether it's just that you want to raise amazing children and that's your focus and you and you've decided you're going to do that together and have them be successful or um, you know that you're going to build a business together and that's your focus or you know you see like YouTube couples traveling the world in their minivans or their you know their little tiny houses and stuff like that there's a there's a shared vision for the lifestyle and what they want to create and that's the thing that that supports being able to I'm not saying it's the thing that makes you 100% airtight because that doesn't exist as far as staying together but that's the kind of thing that helps you work through when all the BS starts to come up and the pain and the stuff that you haven't worked on, the stuff that you haven't healed, it, rather than let it get in the way and actually end the relationship. It gives you a reason, a motivation to heal yourself and to work on that stuff. And I feel like Will and Jada definitely illustrated that they have that. I mean, clearly, by just the, the work that they're doing now together, they illustrated that they have that. This is not to say that, you know... No couple's 100%. They may or may not decide to stay together, but I don't know about you, Brian. You can tell me what you think. I feel like from the conversation that they had, whether they stay together or not in the long term, that they will have an unconditional love for each other regardless, like that they will always wish each other well. Don't you think so? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could sell at the end of the video when they were talking to each other about um, their love. Yeah. Uh, specifically, when Will was saying that that he told Jada that he could love her through anything, and there was a part two that that wasn't shown in the clip that Jada had said something similar to to Will, and the only thing that was uncertain was that they had to go through some stuff for the reality of that statement or those statements to be true. Yeah, yeah. Right? That um, I think even if they, to your point, even if they had not stayed together, that they would have been a tight, 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 tight family. Yeah. Period. Absolutely. They would have been there co-parenting uh, and doing family things together and all that, and that that would have never have ended. Right. Um, the thing that they discovered was there was more more for them than that. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, ultimately, that's the end goal. I mean, you know, life is so ever changing. And the idea is, yeah, you want to be able to be in a relationship that stays together forever. But if it's not going to stay together forever, you want to know that, especially if you have children with somebody, that you have joined your life with somebody that it doesn't have to be ugly if you end it or it doesn't have to be contentious you don't have to have resentment it just doesn't have to be that way even though we so believe that it does we believe that we have to stand on our resentments and hold on to that pain and take it into like you were saying brian take it into that next relationship but you know what was really great about this and the fact that they have a shared vision you just know that you know like you were saying it, it's going to continue on and they're going to still be creating that vision even if they were to break up and go and be with other people People, you know that that is a that is a possibility. What do you think, Brian? You think it's a good time to take a commercial break because we got five more to go, and I don't want to just fire hose the people. I want to give them a little a little well, moment to do that. Yeah, take a little commercial break to soak it in. All right, cool. You ready? We'll be back, everybody, with the other five of the ten ways that Will and Jada, I believe, Will and Jada make it work based on the Red Table Talk conversation. What's up, everybody? We're back and we're talking about how Will and Jada make it work and how you can, too, even if you're not rich and famous. It's possible. I'm talking about 10 ways you can make it work and 10 ways that I think they're making it work based on the conversation of the Red Table Talk. And I keep saying based on the conversation of the Red Table Talk because I realize we don't see their entire lives. We just saw that snippet that they allowed us to see. But I feel like it was very authentic and revealing in a lot of ways. And, you know, we don't know what we don't know, but we do know what 
what was presented to us. So by my perception, there are 10 things that they are definitely doing and 10 things that you can start doing today in whatever relationship you're in that will have it be as workable and as some people called it weird because some people feel like being able to get along and have an adult conversation about contentious things is weird. But to be able to have that kind of weirdness, because that weirdness sounds pretty peaceful to me. I would rather be able to have a calm conversation with someone who um, made a mistake in my life or if I made a mistake in their life than to be in some big crazy conflict because lord knows there's enough going on in the world right now that we don't need extra conflict in our relationships and in our life so we're at number six if you've been with us you've you heard the first five number six is that you know we talk about this every show and we will probably talk about it every show communication they're willing to have the hard conversations with each other and they're saying all the things that are scary to say because they know that the truth shall set you free. I'm, I'm a truther. I've been a truther since I was a little kid. And a lot of times when you're the truther in the family, you, there's a little bit of isolation to it. Because people generally, in general, don't want to hear the truth. They say they do. But, you know, even Will being able to admit that he was done with Jada, like that he was in that space, for a lot of people, that would be something that would trigger some anger. And maybe at some point in their relationship, it did. But, you know, being able to have those hard conversations where you're really flat about how you felt is uh, invaluable to being able to have peace in your relationship and to be able to just have a conversation about something that actually solves a problem and has you move forward rather than causes a lot of conflict. Brian, what do you think about, um, you know, being a married man and really being able to say the things that are on your mind and having hard conversations, all of that kind of stuff? How do you frame that sort of thing? Without Ooh. without blowing you up in front of you. What's that? Um, it. We're going there tonight. We're going there tonight. And I know I know Sasha's watching, so <laughs> you're gonna have to be real, real. Well, you know, my my wife is so understanding yeah. on everything that <laughs> You better say that. <laughs> um, you know, it's again it's 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 hard, right? Yeah. This is part of the work, right? Because yeah. You have two people that come from two different backgrounds and two different experiences, and you're learning to commune together. Yeah. And so as part of that, there's communication that has to kind of bridge the gap. Yeah. And so um, you have to practice it. Yeah. You just have to practice talking to each other and, and in a way where the other person can hear and and understand Mm -hmm. as well as the other person has to practice listening um, and kind of keeping themselves a little in check because again not not every conversation is going to be easy yeah to hear totally Uh, there's going to be things at which (laughs) even the two of us talk about where it's hard for each other each one of us to hear but we need to say what, what's on our mind and our heart. Totally. Again, in a way where we can hear it. it. This is not like, you know, quote unquote, a bitch session where you can just dump on someone and then you can't hear you. Right. But you can tell people that, you know, when this happens, this comes up for me. I'm not sure if this is about what you are doing or if this is something that is buried within me. Uh, that I've been kind of pushing down all my life, uh, but I, w- I need and want you to understand that this is what's happening and that I need your support in moving through this. Yeah. And I love the way that you just framed that because, you know, it's it's not th- that, you know, you have to remember a perfect script, but the way that you put that is very like, I'm not trying to beat you down about this. I'm not trying to make you wrong about it. And I think a lot of times the reason that we, we struggle with having the hard conversations is because we're, first of all, we, we there's a part of us that wants to make our partner wrong. And then we're afraid that they're going to respond to how they're going to respond to our wrong making even when we don't even know that we're wrong making and we're afraid that they're going to get angry about what we're going to say right or we're afraid that they're going to have an emotional or visceral reaction but I think what you just illustrated is when we're willing to own the feeling and then talk about it 
it leaves a little bit of space for our partner to actually be able to respond to our ownership and not respond to, you know, an accusation, which makes people feel like they want to defend themselves. Right. Because I love the way you put that. If somebody communicated to me in that way, I would be able to open up and have a conversation with them. You know, I don't know. That's what I think. (laughs) <laughs> fair <laughs> now, number seven one thing I think that they really illustrated as well is self love and personal peace so I think that they both over the years um, as far as what we see have um, developed sort of a, a framework that's built by self acceptance and just acceptance of who they are in the relationship and you know maybe a lot of that may have to do with being Hollywood celebrities and stuff like that but I think that as hum- regular humans walking this earth that willingness to be peaceful with yourself and develop that personal peace it makes it so much easier not to feel so thrown off and uncertain by what the people in your life choose to do or what they choose to say when you know who you are and you have a piece about it because someone doesn't agree with the way you do something doesn't have to like completely throw you off your game. You don't have to lose your shit. You don't have to get into a fight with somebody. You know, it doesn't it just doesn't have to turn into that when you're more solid in who you are. That's not to say that no one will ever make you mad. But the the frequency of that occurrence tends to dampen a little bit when we're just willing to love ourselves and accept ourselves. So number eight, and I'm going to have to do the rest of these with velocity because I see the clock is just ticking down. Number eight, the willingness to be vulnerable. So, right, that that willingness, and you kind of illustrated that just a little while ago, Brian, when you were talking about how you would present a, an issue with your wife. But just to openly speak your pain without needing to blame it. You know, just just this is how I'm feeling like I'm I'm having an insecure moment or, you know, one thing that they did that I thought was great when Jada was talking about how much pain she was in. And they and I think Will said the same thing, like that's a vulnerable thing to say. And vulnerable vulnerableness is not weakness. It's strength. Like to be able to say that I'm human and I I have emotions, I feel emotions, especially for men. I mean, I hate to to genderize and, you know, I'm not trying to be binary, but I do think culturally, I think for men to be able to say, you know, I'm having these feelings. And then also for women, I think sometimes we struggle with with not having to blame something for our feelings. Like, it's like, we don't want to just own them. We want to have them and then put them on something, which I think that's, that's our defense mechanism. But just being able to own, we're humans. We're supposed to feel stuff. Yeah. Right. (laughs) It's okay. Feel it. Feel it. it So you can heal it. (laughs) Right. It's okay. When you feel something, even if it feels like a negative feeling, it's there for a reason. It's there to teach us and to grow us. And rather than blame it on something, take it outside of ourselves, pretend like it's not there or stuff it down, be vulnerable about it. Talk about it, share about it, especially with your partner, someone that you say you love. If you love this person, you're willing to give them the gift of sharing who you are with them. That's, that's truly part of what loving someone is. Number nine, no one is trying to control the other person. There's no ultimatums. No one is insisting that the other partner be a certain way for their own sake. Like if you notice in their conversation, what they really represented there was that no one was trying to say, you know, when you do that better, you do this and that and do this in the way that I want, then I can be better. No one was trying to say, you owe me an apology. You got to make up for this thing. You got to do things in a certain way in order for me to be okay in this relationship. And we do that to each other all the time right and I'm not saying this from a place on high I've done it to people I find myself doing it to people I have to catch myself when I'm doing it to people whether it's romantic relationships friendships whatever that need for that other person to do something in order for you to be okay is a relationship killer like nothing kills intimacy better than trying to control how someone shows up in your life, whether you're making them, you know, whatever it is you're trying to make them do. Sometimes it's the words they use or the way they do things. You know, you might not like it, but when you try to control someone and force them to do it a different way rather than 
uh, going back to that willingness to be vulnerable and talk about what you're feeling behind it and all of that stuff and just own that. You don't leave them any space to make a decision. It's like, you know, they're, it, you have to not treat your partner like a pet, right? It's not like you just do what I say because I say you do it or you just do what I say. Otherwise, I'm going to make your life hell because that's like ultimatums. It's, it doesn't work. It doesn't cause intimacy. People stay together for a long time doing that. Don't get me wrong. But I feel like if you want a relationship that works and has that level of peace, you got to be really, really flat about not you know, giving ultimatums and trying to control the other person. Number 10, I really, like I said earlier, I believe that they have learned to love each other unconditionally. I talk about it all the time. People fight me on it. Um, you know, on social media, people fight me on it in conversation that love is unconditional. It love is unconditional. If it's not unconditional, it's not love. And I'll say it a million times. Love doesn't mean that you let someone wreak havoc in your life. Love doesn't mean that you try to hold on to them and control them or force them to stay with you or force yourself to stay with them if it's not good for you. Love means that I'm I'm fully self-accepted and I will be okay regardless of what you choose and I can overflow onto you. And if that means that I have to do it from afar, that's okay. I can still wish you well. I don't have to have contention. I don't have to have resentment. I don't have to hold on to anything. I don't have to make your life a living hell. I don't need to be vengeful. I can wish the best for you 100% and love you for everything that you are, everything that you aren't, and everything in between. I can forgive your weaknesses and admire your strengths and I can do what I need to do to also take care of myself and that is love however that needs to look in action with each unique relationship we want to make it about something else we want to make it mean that you know if I love you that means I'm having sex with you every night if I love you that means that I'm staying with you forever no matter what if I love you that means I let you beat the fool out of me it doesn't mean any of that (laughs) Right. That's why people are so afraid to think that it's unconditional because they're afraid they're going to end up in a situation that is not good for them. But you can love someone and not be in a in a situation with them. You can love someone. Mel Robbins, I was just watching a clip with her. She was talking about friendship. You can love a friend and not want to hang out with them. You can want the absolute best for them and realize that you're in two different stages in life where you might have been in the same stage before and you, you don't spend as much time with them and you can still love them just as much. It's just a, a wishing of well. And I don't need to make you wrong. I don't need to sit on my resentments. All that good stuff. All right, I could just beat this. You know how I get on my soapboxes, Brian. Oh, watch out. Honey, you know. <laughs> But that, you know, let me wrap up just the part about Will and Jada. I love the way that they they were willing to expose themselves like this. I know it's very popular, so people will be like, oh, you know, it's just because they're celebrities, whatever. Don't write it off. If you're in a relationship or if you want a relationship, it's worth it to watch this video to just get an understanding of how people interact with each other when they're just allowing each other to be, willing to build together and let each other be who they are. That's... That's love. That's a relationship. That's what I want, Brian. I want somebody who's like sees me for everything I am and is like, I'm cool with it. Yeah. I ride with it. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I think that um, uh, once you've had a taste of what that can be like, right? Just a taste. Yeah. Nothing else comes close. Right? Nothing else comes close. It's so true. It's so true. And the thing, too, is like even for people who've been in a relationship for a long time, it's never too late to begin to experience that, even if you feel like it is. And I feel like they're also a good example of being together for a couple of decades and, um, you know, going through those trials and tribulations and then finding their way back to each other just because of a willingness to heal. And it's never too late to heal. Right. Never, ever, ever, ever too late. Right. As long as we're we're here on this earth. All right. So that is that. Let me climb down off my soapbox. Let me get back down (laughs) on the floor because I want to do our our new segment, our new segment, Matchmaker Moments. All right. Right. Are you excited for Matchmaker Moments? Is that? Oh, I love that. That's going to be our theme music. 
<laughs> yeah, I can't sing y'all. <laughs> I like that though. That's that kind of reminds us like '60s dating show you were doing, right? <laughs> yeah. I love it. That kind of reminds me. I feel like that should be our little uh, our little intro. Maybe a little. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. Know. What was that show? Um, the one where it was like three behind the the, the wall the or whatever. Dating the, the dating game. Yes. Anyways, I love that show. Oh, it was a great show. So we're, oh, yeah. so we're trying... So what's happening oh. in Matchmaker Moments today? Yeah, so I'm going to present a client, sort of a client question. And actually, this is not a question that came from a client, but a question that I want to see what people have to say about. Just because I, you know, I've already um, had some coaching with this client. And I want to see, you know, what, what you think, Brian, and what anybody who wants to chime in thinks about... On this week's Matchmaker Moment, I have a client who is young and beautiful, and she's a little bit on the hefty side, but she does care about herself. You know, she works out and stuff like that, but, you know, she's she's a round, curvy girl, but she works hard, has an amazing career, um, makes good money. She's young, and so for someone her age, she actually makes a, a good living, and she really wants to have a long-term partner, but has dealt with a lot of rejection in her dating journey. Now, she lives in a city where it can be very superficial. I feel like, you know, there's certain uh, localities and me- metropolises where there's a certain expectation uh, when it comes to physicality, right? Right. Like New York, L.A., people expect everybody they date to be perfectly, you know, a size two, beautiful, fantastic person. But, um, you know, I think and she believes that that is her issue. She believes that, you know, there it's a, a thing where. Um, men where she lives now are not attracted to her because of physical reasons. And to tell the truth, some of the feedback that I've gotten is that she wasn't their physical type, that she was too crass on the date, or that she lives too far geographically, which I think lives too far geographically is one of those like veils for something else. Because, uh-huh. you know, when somebody's really attracted to somebody... <laughs> <laughs> when they really want them, like Hop on a plane, exactly, they'll do what they need a to bus. do. Yes, <laughs> right. Road trip, they'll do what they need to do. So I gave her a little bit of advice um, because she's been dating a lot, and she she's usually a yes for a second date, but she's usually met with a no. What do you think, Brian? What do you think is good advice? Good matchmaker advice for this client? Wow. I know I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> But you can okay. give the man's right, point so of view. What do I think here? Yeah, um, it's hard. It, yeah. It is hard. I mean, it, it is. And and I, I the old adage is, you know, you you know, it's like putting on clothes, right? I mean, you you you, you go in to try some clothes at the mall or whatever. And mm-hmm. Some some things fit just perfect, and you know, but you don't like the color. <laughs> <laughs> and other things don't, you know, you love the color, but they don't fit right. Yeah. So you keep moving until you find the right fit and everything else for yourself. Um, but along the way, maybe there's some inner work there Yeah. for her. I mean, um, um, because, I mean, my grandparents used to say there is always somebody for somebody to love. Right. So, you know, so there is somebody out there for her. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of if she's feeling a certain way, maybe that's a clue that maybe there's some more inner work that she needs to do so that she can open herself up to that one or those people to come into her life that she can have a longer term relationship with. Yeah. No, I love that. And I love what you're what you're pointing to as far as, um, you know, if if she is feeling like that's the problem. A lot of times when we take things personally or we feel like uh, the way someone feels about us is a problem there, we are having agreement with it, especially if it gives us a lot of contention. So we have an opportunity. We can either take it on. And, and, you know, figure out what we want to do about it, or we can just leave it by the wayside and not care about it. But I agree with you. You said your grandparents, there is a cap for every bottle. And I think it's important to stay true to who you are, continue to grow, and just know that the person that is the, the compliment to you is not going to be hindered by your weight, your geography, any of that stuff. That person that, that is the compliment to you. That's not to say just be as big and fat and nasty as you want to be. 
<laughs> take care of yourself. Like if you love yourself, anybody that you run into, they can only love you to the level that you're willing to love yourself. So take care of your body, whatever is your best. You always want to be you know, being whatever is your best that makes you feel the best. And if you feel the best, you're definitely going to um, ultimately match with that person that gets you at your best. And that's that's just simply what you want to do. If they don't like the way you look, then they ain't for you. Wow. Right. Wow. Right. So you said we're down to three. We only got three minutes. OK, I'm going to do the rest with real velocity. Tonight's client profile. I have a beautiful woman of color, incredibly educated, loves dogs and is all about personal responsibility and growth. She has an amazing career, makes a great salary, mid 40s, but looks like she's in her mid 30s. If you're interested or know someone who may be a great match, email me. She's super pretty and smart. She's very funny. Really nice girl. Um, woman, I should say. And yeah, you just, you just got to hit me up. I love that you put the website, Brian, just put the website in the comments, just hit me up and apply for recruiting and I'll screen you for her. Now, what else do I want to say before we have to go? I'm a matchmaker photographer. Like I said, hit, hit the, um, website, click, become a recruit. I'll screen you. If not for this particular client, we have a whole Rolodex of clients. I have a whole bunch of clients. If you want to be matched up with somebody, you got to get at me. Also, every Monday night, I host the Epic Circle, an online healing circle for women everywhere. If you go to Eventbrite or go to Meetup, you can find the Epic Circle. Epic stands for Enough, Peaceful, Illuminated, and Courageous. And, you know, it's a healing circle where we sit around and we have these conversations and everybody gets to talk. It's not just me fire hosing you like on this show. And then also follow me on Instagram at Ask for Candy Podcast, at Candy Love, Love Coach, and follow us at Solivity Magazine so you can check out all the other really great shows that are on the channel. We got the Solivity TV is blowing up, Brian. Damn straight. Right? I feel like it's going to be. Yeah, it's even a- more stuff. Got a whole um, lot of workouts and stuff. Go ahead, honey. Tell them. Yeah, I mean, tomorrow um, on Instagram, we're going to be doing a special live with one of our newest hosts. You've known him a, a long time, uh, D'Angelo Thompson. His new show, Beauty and Gratitude, yes. debuts at uh, this Friday at 8 o'clock. So you don't want to miss that. But we'll be on Instagram, I think, around 12 o'clock tomorrow. So yeah. we'll be talking about his show. Awesome. And he's amazing. He's a friend from way back. I always call he's my gay husband. So you have to tune in. I love him with all of my heart. Um, And that's it. Until next time, never forget that you are a love machine. If you ever start to feel like you aren't getting the love you need, just make more and then ask for candy. Bye, everybody. Love you. (laughs) 